Dear colleagues, dear friends, um, it's my pleasure to have you today on our side. Uh, I have a warm welcome for you for this very important and interesting uh, session. And together with my colleagues, uh, Professor Francesco Prusata from Rome, Italy, and Professor Nikos Werner from Trier, Germany, uh, we will discuss hot topics uh, for in the interventional uh, cardiology field. Uh, the question we would like to answer and to discuss with you, what is the right way in patients with high-risk PCIs or cardiogenic shock um, with respect to that, what we have to do, um, thinking about extensive revascularization, revascularization. The question, what is the right timing? The question, whether this can be optimized by mechanical support devices to improve the outcome of these high-risk patients. We have registry data and we have study data. Very often it is important to see what's really going on in the, in the real world and can that what we know today and is done today according to studies, uh, whether this can be further improved. So we have um, really in a very interesting half an hour, and it's my pleasure that uh, Professor Prosata from Italy starts with the first talk and new insights of, I think, especially Italian insights um, on the outcome of patients with multivessel diseases and cardiogenic shock and or in high risk PCI scenarios. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for this kind uh, presentation. Uh, we will discuss uh, together about uh, th these topics. These are my conflicts of interest. And uh, I would like to uh, start questioning what we should expect from impeller use during, for example, PCI in a critical patient. If uh, we uh, look at simulation, we are in the 90s, of the past centuries, you may imagine that uh, it can protect from, from the hemodynamic crash of the patient. So this was uh, very theoretical, but we have been able to show this uh, in our daily practice. This is uh, an inflation of a, a left main balloon and you see on the right how pulsatile pressure is completely lost due to the, due to the inflation of uh, the balloon in the left main. And uh, thank you for impel assistance. The patient has uh, uh, survived to this uh, operation. And uh, you see how long will take the pressure to come back to be pulsatile. So when you see like, things like that, you are really convinced about the fact that uh, you may really have something from in, impel assist, assistance. What uh, uh, this was uh, one of the uh, questions that we tried to better assess uh, by reviewing uh, the consoles data extracted and analyzed in 37 consecutive patients. And this was the objective of this uh, publication, showing that 100% uh, of, of the patient had the continuous pump assistance, so no device malfunction all over the time was documented, all patients had systolic blood pressure values up around 80 or more millimeters, and no bailout use of inotropic drugs during this uh, period. 47% of the patients had significant hemodynamic drops, reflecting potential instability without impella. And significant hemodynamic drops were predicted by jeopardized myocardium. And here we enter in another aspect, how the complexity of the coronary tree we are going to treat may influence the outcome of our procedure. And what we also tried to assess was if what happens to the heart after our interventions and this was the topic of this uh, large two-center study performed with the Verona group, in which we assessed the ejection fraction before PCI and that follow-up in 86 consecutive, consecutive chip patients undergoing Pella-protected PCI. And by comparing the 
um, left ventricles, we have been able to show that there is an improvement for ejection fraction. And this improvement, when you split the patients according to the amount of uh, jeopardized um, myocardium, you may see that there is really an improvement of those patients who are with very poor ejection fraction. So there is the possibility to recover the arts in these cheap patients. Is it possible to stratify the revascularization extent in cheap? I, I think that there are many ways in doing this. However, in this particular setting, it makes sense to simplify as, as much as possible. And in doing this, we selected the, the simple uh, British Society of uh, Interventional Cardiology score, in which uh, you assign 12 points basically to all the uh, stenosis. In the case, there are stenosis all over the coronary tree. And you may uh, evaluate the revascularization index you achieve. So if you have complete revascularization, you have one, like in this patient, and the revascularization so is complete. complete. In the case, uh, you just uh, leave uh, uh, an LED which is closed, you have 0.5, like in these particular patients, and you have revascularization that is fairly incomplete. This is much more convenient as compared to uh, Sintascore and probably less operator dependent. So we uh, uh, assessed the impact of revascularization extent on this LV reco recover evolution. And what we found was the fact that by stratifying the patients according to their tiles of revascularization index, you have a higher recover in patients with more extensive revascularization. And uh, moving forward, uh, we want to recover the art, but we want also to assess the clinical impact of that. And this was the topic that was assessed by my colleague, Cristina Aurigemma, in this uh, large uh, study, the uh, IMPIT, which is basically a registry performed in uh, all the centers in Italy that used more uh, Impella in the past. So you have uh, inside many patients collected in different groups, this uh, study was successful because you see that it was published in JCC Intervention and then published at the last PCR in uh, the uh, outline session. And uh, this is the study design in the IMPIT registry. There were more than 400 patients. And those patients uh, with either cardiogenic shock or um, high-risk PCI receiving um, PCI have been included, provided that uh, the angiography was known, fully known. In this uh, group, uh, we performed the uh, assessment of revascularization index, like I uh, showed before, and we uh, assessed the clinical outcome up to one year. The primary endpoint was all close death, non fatal myocardial infarction, and non fatal stroke. So, very hard outcome. Secondary endpoints were the individual endpoint. This is uh, how we stratified again the same methodology, the vascularization index, and on average it was 0.67. So, there was with wide variations. These are the uh, characteristics of the study population. As I mentioned, there were both uh, high-risk PCI and patients with established cardiogenic shock before. When you look at the stratification of revascularization index by their tiles, you see that there were a, a, a significant amount of patients exposed to less extensive revascularization, and we compared those with those patients with mid to higher their tiles. This is the primary endpoint uh, for the entire population. And uh, you may see that there was a significant improved outcome with those patients with a higher revascularization. And uh, uh, splitting by uh, the secondary endpoints, you see that there was an impact on the hard endpoint, significant impact on all-cause mortality. 
Regarding the subgroup of patients with established cardiogenic shock before PCI, we uh, noted the same uh, impact for less extent revascularization. And regarding the uh, secondary point, again, there was an impact on all cause mortality. In the subgroup of uh, high risk PCI, there was uh, less. Uh, absolute number of events, but still significant impact for less extensive revascularization associated with worse outcome. And for combined endpoints, there were just trends for all the uh, endpoints. So this was uh, an important piece of knowledge. And uh, another aspect that is part of our routine uh, questions when we are planning complex uh, decisions is uh, if bailout use can be comparable with the elective insertion of impella. This is uh, probably something that is even more difficult to be uh, assessed with, uh, with trials, however, uh, there are uh, important uh, scientific uh, background. This is an animal study showing that if you uh, unload the ventricle with a similar amount of ischemia, you may protect the myocardium. So this means that by itself, the preventive insertion of uh, an, uh, cardiac assistance might protect the heart. So uh, to try to, to answer this using uh, the, uh, the available uh, scientific data, we have, uh, during the last years, collected um, important uh, uh, registry data. This is uh, 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 an important study which comes from uh, uh, for Germany and uh, in which uh, the very critical patients uh, presenting with cardiogenic shock after are resuscitated uh, cardiac arrest uh, have been uh, um, have been compared for short and long term outcome according to timing of impella assistance. So you have in blue impella before PCI, in pink impella after PCI in this group of patients. When you look at blood lactate, a very important parameters that uh, is so associated with late outcomes of those critical patients. You see definitely that the, starting from similar uh, fissures, there is a split in favor of pre treatment with Impella. And looking at the survival during this study, you see that there is an important and statistically significant advantage for Impella implantation before PCI. Uh, since we had uh, the access to this uh, uh, in Italian registry, we also looked at that. Um, Giuseppe Tarantini, our friend, was responsible for this uh, analysis, and the publication is just appearing in catheterization this year. And again, uh, the, the patients have been split between those in which they, uh, in whom the implantation was performed actively before PCI or on bailout during or after PCI initiation. Looking at one year survival in cardiogenic shock patients treated by PCI, there is a statistically significant advantage for these patients. And looking at all the characteristics of the patients, you may see that important aspects like complications and bleeding are significantly lower when Impella was, has been applied before. This means that when you are able to plan your procedure in a better way, you probably do a better job in, time, in, in terms of safety. Uh, this is, these are the extreme of patients, cardiogenic shock with different uh, aspects. But uh, what about those patients with high risk PCI? Uh, again, we came through our uh, Italian registry, and you see that for one year survivor, there is again less number of events, but still significant advantage for uh, impella implantation before. And also for measured adverse events, you have a significant advantage. So these are basically not randomized uh, data, but uh, they are really reflecting what happens in the cat lab of uh, centers with different experience in different parts, at least of Europe.
So my conclusions are that uh, very recent, recent evidences from large clinical experiences support the concepts that more complete revascularization is associated with better clinical outcomes in both cardiogenic shock and high-risk PCI patient subgroups and the insertion of impeller before PCI might be associated with better clinical outcomes in post-cardiac arrest, cardiogenic shock, and high-risk PCI patients. All of these uh, information should be, for sure, taken into account of the absence of randomized evidences, but I think that clinical practice really makes sense in this part of cardiovascular sciences. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for these uh, fantastic new data sets. Um, I'm pretty sure um, even this is still experience from registry. There are a lot of new hot topics which needs to be discussed. If we think how the guideline has been changed uh, two, three years ago, according to the culprit uh, trial, where we thought probably we should do only that, what is absolutely necessary, we have probably now... Um, the first idea is that um, we should think the other way around since we have uh, mechanical support systems. Probably I can uh, start, Francesco, with uh, two questions. The first question I would like to have in, 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 in the RIMPI trial, uh, the circulatory support was done with an Impella 2.5, uh, 5.0 uh, and so on and so on. So, so different to, uh, support uh, uh, unloading scenarios. Do you have experience or data showing us the, um, which impeller support was that what the patient really needed? I mean, my personal experience is uh, if you have just in 2.5, uh, and I speak in a patient in a shock, uh, I principally, I would like to have uh, a, a higher support, or is this not um, important under these conditions? What do you think? So uh, this, uh, this registry was a retrospective de um, registry. So uh, the, the period in which just uh, the Impella 2.5 was the uh, only percutaneous device available was captured. And what we uh, noticed was the fact that in Italy, CP is basically replacing 2.5 for all cardiogenic shock patients. And uh, however, the number of patients and the number of confounding factors was not able to, um, to let us show that there was an impact of CP uh, as compared to 2.5. I think that is unfair also because due to the fact that the CP device is available, we are now treating more uh, diseased patients, I think, as compared in the past. So uh, I, I think basically that the CP offer, offers a new opportunity as compared to 2.5 and specifically for those patients with the cardiogenic shock, it is the uh, pump that should be preferred. No, I, I also agree. I believe most of the patient will have a benefit when we use the CP. Uh, Nikos, what is your experience thinking about 2.5 or CP? I think uh, there is a constant shift uh, towards CP because you are definitely more flexible with the CP system. Um, you can, uh, of course, um, have the advantages of the smaller system uh, by uh, um, unloading only the ventricle only a little bit, for example. But if the patient, for example, deteriorates, um, you, you have the option to go for more unloading, for example. So definitely, I, I also see that in, in our hospital and other hospitals that there's a trend towards the CP. Yeah. Um, and probably another interesting question could be, uh, Francesco, um, with the CP, how long the CP usually stayed in the patients? And do you have upgrade scenarios that you say, okay, I don't know, five, six, seven days, CP, patient is still in the shock. Uh, do you just prolong then the CP or do you go to a 5 -0 concept? How is yeah. your thinking literally about that? So I, I think that you are uh, really entering the the, um, the questions that are part of our, our of our daily practice and where clinical trials 
will not be available probably never. So uh, I, I think that uh, the, uh, the the pumps may stay, I mean, more than, than just two or three days, but as soon as you have prolonged assistance, you encounter more patients in which there are some device, I mean, uh, imperf imperfect functions requiring for uh, uh, something different. So sometimes we had to uh, go to higher assistance level. And in other cases, we had just to change the pump for a similar one. But besides all of these aspects, the, the truth is the fact that those patients who after one week or 10 days have complete no recover, I think that are those group of patients in which a, a bridge to other treatment should be probably part of. And the idea that the FIBO might be a, a further delayed bridging is something that I know that is part of the experience of many good centers. I have a um, clinical question. So if you you are able due to the impeller you are able to improve and to reduce the revascularization uh, or improve the revascularization index but you have not reached uh, 0.65 so still something to do how long do you wait to bring the patient to uh, to the next level according to the guidelines and acute uh, acute coronary syndromes, we say we should do that in the next 40 days. But according to that, what you have shown us here, um, I have the impression it would be better to be faster, isn't it? So honestly, I think that when you have you are on impel assistance is the ideal situation to perform a great job in, in your patient. However, the and so to go for extensive revascularization is part of our plan when we decide to implant, to implant in Pella, either in elective or in shock patients. However, there are limitations associated with PCI that are mainly, in my mind, the contrast media we are going to administer. So if you really think that the I mean, the next level of revascularization, the next vessel, would require a lot of contrast, and you already did a reasonable amount of revascularization. For us, is a good option to delay it. Other aspect is those group of patients in which you implanted the device after recovering one vessel, after having treated the culprit lesion, and on assistance, you see that there is no signal for recovery of the patient. So in this group of patients, sometimes we bring back the patients in the lab. We finish the job in, in two, three days, I mean, after the first index, index procedure, and then we start planning the winning with the device. So I think that this is a patient-by-patient -patient decision, and all of these aspects are those in which experience probably is uh, very important and, and uh, discussion like that are important because to share our experience is important uh, for the future. I think that was a, a very good uh, advice. And if we use Impella uh, as a smart assist, we have also the opportunities to see online um, how the uh, left ventricle is recovering or not. And if you still have something to do, that could be something what I also would use already in my daily uh, routine to find the right time for the second step. Francesco, that was a really great presentation. I think uh, if we can show that more and more and more and more studies, uh, then we will have here a new uh, century of changing the strategies in the um, PCI uh, scenarios and patient with shock. So now we go to the next talk to, to Nikos Werner from Trier. And and uh, I'm very interested to see what you will show us. I've heard you have a case also prepared for us. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, I will talk in the next couple of minutes uh, with you about the revascularization strategies with mechanical circulatory support. So these are my conflicts of interest. 
And I would like to answer with you two questions um, and also connected to, uh, to, a pace, uh, to a case. So the first question is, uh, when you use mechanical circulatory support, what, what is that what I can expect? And the second question is concerning the revascularization strategy, what, is, uh, what should I aim for? What is my primary goal in um, revascularization? I think these are two um, really important questions, especially um, in uh, complex PCI, but also in cardiogenic shock. And we have very similar situations from a pathophysiological standpoint. So um, also in complex PCI with reduced cardiac output, we have the situation that our uh, cardiac output um, is maybe low. We have uh, part. Uh, we have uh, times of hypotension uh, with low coronal perfusion pressure. The LVDP increases also um, uh, due to pulmonary congestion. And this is also present, as you know, in cardiogenic shock. And in all these complex procedures. We have a prolonged lesion preparation, for example, due to repeated balloon inflatations. We have throat ablation or any other kind of lesion preparation. And these aggravate um, uh, the situation. Um, and we come more and more in the situation that the LDEDP increases. Um, and we come to a situation where we have progressive myocardial dysfunction and maybe circulatory depression. This is also, in addition, aggravated by longer procedure time, so you use more contrast dye and uh, maybe more volume as well. So, the first question, what can I expect from a mechanical circulatory support? And I will focus on the percutaneous um, impeller system. Um, the first most important thing, I think, is shown um, on the upper left. You can see that you can uh, get an unloading of the left ventricle. So the volume pressure curve um, is shifted uh, to the left. So the volume decreases, the pressure decreases, and you get an unloading of the left ventricle. This is, of course, especially interesting in situation, as Francesco Bosetta, Bosetta already showed you, when you have, for example, inflated a balloon in the left mainstem. On the upper right, you can see that we also uh, get an increase in coronary perfusion. I will come to that in the, uh, in the next slide. Uh, we also can prevent myocardial stunning. And the final point also um, already mentioned by Francesco is uh, that we can have, uh, that we have data available showing a reduction in the incidence of acute kidney injury when we use um, uh, mechanical circulatory support devices. So here's a very interesting example, I think, uh, where you can see how coronary perfusion in critical coronary artery stenosis is impacted by impeller. So the authors in this study, they did recording of the distal coronary pressure. We are pressure wire. They measured the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. And in addition, they measured the systemic blood pressure. And what you can see in the upper part of the slide is um, the LVDP and also the distal coronary pressure um, when the impeller support was at a minimum level of P2, so lower than one liter per minute. In the lower part, you see the same tracings with maximal support P8 with a flow of above three liter per minute. And when you uh, have a close look at the, um, at the blood pressure tracings, you can see that the LVDP decreases from 21 millimeter mercury on minimal support to 18 millimeter mercury on maximal support. The same holds true for the aortic mean pressure increase from 68 millimeter mercury to 86. And the distal coronary pressure, so the pressure distally of a severe stenosis, increases from low support, 35 millimeter mercury, to 41 millimeter mercury with high support. And when you look at that for uh, a, um, a large cohort, you can see that every hemodynamic in the patient increases due to a positive, um, in, uh, in the direction of a positive effect. So you 
increase aortic pressure, you decrease LVEDP, and you increase distal coronary pressure. And um, this is something I think which is really critical in complex PCI procedures, but also in cardiogenic shock. This brings me to the second question. What should I aim for? I think um, in terms of revascularization, Francesco Bosetta has, has shown you an excellent, uh, excellent data from uh, the Italian registry. And I think um, we have to decide um, today whether we want to do a more anatomically based or ischemia based um, complete revascularization. And I think the most um, often used revascularization strategy is that shown in the lower part of the slide. So a reasonable, complete revascularization. We look at the anatomic uh, stenosis and um, we um, evaluate non-invasively or invasively the ischemia in the dependent myocardium and then decide whether we go for revascularization um, or not. This is of really um, uh, high importance. Um, so these, this is different data uh, from the QT trial showing the residual syntax score after revascularization. And you can nicely appreciate that the higher the, residu the residual syntax score, the worse is the outcome. Um, so our strategy needs to be functional um, revascularization and complete revascularization. Okay, and another important aspect is um, for high-risk uh, procedures that we have a careful look at the individual anatomy, the individual comorbidities of um, our patients, and this together um, influences our revascularization strategy. And of course, uh, we need to discuss about the equipment, about um, the degree maybe of lesion preparation we have to um, use uh, for the individual patient. So uh, let me start with a patient example. I think um, uh, this is a nice example of revascularization and mechanical support. It's a 68-year-old male. He came to our hospital with unstable angina. He has additional comorbidities as, such as a severe peripheral and cerebral artery disease. Um, he was pretty stable with a heart rate of 96 per minute and a blood pressure of 110 over 60. Uh, millimeter mercury. And this is his left ventricular ejection fraction. You can see a very impaired left ventricular uh, function with an LVDP of around 15 millimeter um, mercury. When we looked at the uh, coronaries on the left side, you can appreciate a significant stenosis of uh, the left main. You can also appreciate a right coronary artery, which is uh, probably chronically occluded and uh, retrogradely um, perfused by the left um, coronary system. This is the cor uh, corresponding right coronary artery. Um, as expected, it's proximally completely um, occluded. We did an IVUS uh, pullback of the LAD and the left main, uh, which you can see now, very heavy calcification. Um, also, um, circular calcification as seen here. Um, so, very severe disease, circulatory, thick calcium, um, which makes an extensive lesion preparation probably necessary. In addition, um, as already mentioned, very complex access site. Um, this is the angiogram of the aortic iliac vessel. And you can see uh, stents, extensive stenting on the left side, but also um, already stents on the right side. So how would you treat this patient? And this is a really a daily practice question. Um, when we do the anatomical evaluation, we see a chronically occluded right coronary artery with corresponding akinesia. We see a, um, a retrograde collateralization. We have severe circular calcification in the left main, definitely high syntax score. When we do a clinical evaluation, we have a lot of comorbidities, as mentioned, in addition, um, also a severe COPD, definitely high Euro score or SDS score. So within the heart team, it was decided to go for a PCI procedure instead of uh, bypass grafting. 
and uh, we voted for a protected um, PCI procedure. Um, this is uh, the treatment plan. So concerning the revascularization strategy, we plan to revascularize um, the left main, LAD and CERC first. Uh, we already did the IVUS of the left main, I think very important um, investigation in order to evaluate how extensive our lesion preparation needs to be. Um, in, this, um, in this patient, we plan to go for a shockwave because of the very distal and very circular um, calcification. Uh, we didn't want to do a, a PCI attempt to the CDO of the right coronary artery because the viability was unknown at that time point. Um, we probably need contrast, additional contrast, and um, it was high, highly likely that a retrograde approach is um, necessary, and with this highly and severe stenosis of the left main retrograde approach to the right uh, would be difficult and only possible after treating um, of the left main. So what argues for uh, mechanical circular su uh, support with an impeller CP, that was the plan. I think the one point is that we need unloading. We have expected phases of no flow or low flow with uh, probably reduced pulsatility. Um, we um, need to do extensive lesion preparation and want to limit our myocardial ischemia and pressure drop in the coronary arteries. And finally, um, low pressure, uh, low blood pressure is associated with acute kidney injury and also um, phases uh, of low pressure. So um, these argued in our eyes uh, for a mechanical circulatory support. The impeller CP optical was placed with a long sheath despite the complex um, um, uh, arteriac access. This was no problem. We used a seven French EBU catheter. You can now see the CP um, optical in place, um, the catheter and the two wires in place. And then um, we used, as mentioned, um, the shockwave um, procedure. The shockwave procedure has the advantage that you can do bifurcation with two wires in place. Um, you inflate the balloon to four atmospheres on the balloon, um, there are emitters mounted with use the technology of lithotripsy, which we know from kidney stones. So um, the emitters um, discharge sonic pressure waves. They come to the calcium, they crack the calcium mm -hmm. at very low pressure balloon of balloon inflation, and then you are able to um, dilate um, the heavily calcified stenosis. So this is shown here in action. You can see the angiogram and in the lower part, a model um, where calcium is cracked by the um, shockwave balloon. Um, and you can nicely appreciate how the balloon dilates up. We use the 3.5 by 12 millimeter shockwave balloon at four atmospheres, eight times 10 electrohydraulic impulses uh, were given. Um, and in these phases, the um, left main was completely occluded and the impeller CP was unloading the left ventricle and keeping um, arterial blood pressure up. I think a very nice concept in this um, situation. So the rest is pretty much standard. Um, post dilatation, stent placement, um, kissing balloon inflation on the very low right. Um, also, of course, with the impeller in place. Um, and that was the final result. Also in IVUS, we had a nice adaption of the stent um, to the vessel wall, heavy calcification, as you can see, uh, but good adaption of the stent to the vessel wall. The uh, peripheral was closed with uh, two proglides, um, shown here in the angiogram, and um, this was pretty much then the procedure. So, as a conclusion, and it's a little bit, of course, my personal conclusion, because um, as we already had seen, data is a little bit limited in these um, very individual and specific cases. I think um, when we go for high-risk PCI, um, we want to do an extensive ischemia-driven revascularization. That's 
probably more or less all of our cases the primary goal. I think we need to consider pre-PCI mechanical support. I think you have seen nicely the data from Francesca Bozotta um, showing that pre-PCI mechanical support is much better than a bailout in a bailout situation. The uh, mechanical circulatory support device allows you to perform your individual chosen revascularization therapy with stable hemodynamics throughout the procedure by unloading of the left ventricle. Um, you have preservation of coronary perfusion despite extensive lesion preparation, um, and you have um, a kidney protection during the procedure. I think there's nice data available showing that there's an excellent effect on kidney protection and the reduction in, of acute kidney injury. I think there are some other points we need to keep in mind, of course. Contrast volume should be limited. Um, the best option is to uh, uh, be below 200 milliliters. Any attempt to CTO should be individually di discussed and decided. I think in this, con uh, in this uh, case, um, we uh, go now for evaluation of uh, the inferior wall. If um, we see viable myocardium, we go with a retrograde approach and try to um, open uh, the, um, uh, the uh, chronically occluded right. And I think another point is that we need to assure optimal intensive care um, during our high risk procedures to be uh, to uh, achieve a complete revascularization and also to have a very safe revascularization. Thank you for your attendance. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for these uh, very important insights. First, from the mode of actions, I think it is still important to know that this is with the impeller not only in a pump system which controls the blood pressure. You clearly shown, but also Francesco had shown us data, how important unloading for microperfusion um, mode of action uh, mechanisms are important for safety and uh, long-term beneficial effects. The, the stunning effect, that, but I also like that you um, pointed out that also the other organs are important, like kidney and probably also the brain under these conditions is important. But I also like to see that uh, that you involve the heart team. I think especially in those patients where there's uh, time, it's important to have this kind of the discussions and to find uh, with several bright minds uh, the right way for the patients. Francesco, do you have a uh, last question for uh, for Nikos? Well, I, I think that the management of CTOs lesions is probably the, the less uh, defined uh, uh, field regarding revascularization completeness. You showed uh, a successful management uh, while not treating CTOs. When do you consider performing CTO reopening in this kind of patients? I think this is really an excellent question. I think there are CTO cases, definitely CTO cases, where you would start um, with your protected PCI procedure with the CTO first. I think in most cases, this is uh, if you have uh, the idea that an integrate approach will be successful. I think this is a very important strategy. If you have an occluded um, artery and you feel that an uh, underground approach is possible, it would be, it's always beneficial to open up in the first step the chronically occluded um, um, artery, open it up so you have some backup, additional backup beside the impeller system, of course. Um, but in cases where you need, for example, in this case, a retrograde, probably high risk of a retrograde approach, I think, of course, it's necessary to repair, as, as seen in this example, um, the left side first and then go for the CDO. Yeah, I think, thank you very much uh, again for these uh, great talks and uh, the beginning and the ending of the discussion. It's not my task to, uh, to have a, a short conclusion, but I think it's extremely important that in shock and high risk uh, patients an uh, extensive revascularization is really important. Probably we should use in the daily routine 
um, the Impala, which helps us to deal with the revascularization indices. And that could be really something different from that what we are doing uh, according to the guidelines uh, in the actual moment. Uh, but everything needs to be improved, and probably we have here with the Impala uh, 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 support a new chance to, to improve the scenario for the patients. Everything is not only blood pressure control, Unloading means also tissue uh, control and protection. And if I speak here about the tissue, then I don't mean only the cardiac tissue, but also the renal tissue. And when we speak about the shock, we have to think about all organs. And I think this is a really fantastic new option in our hands for our patients in really severe scenarios. So I have to say thanks again for these great talks, a fantastic uh, discussion and the new insights and I wish you all a happy nice day and further nice discussions with your colleagues. Thank you very much that you was with us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.